this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. And as a black why we as Americans have to reconnect with our roots. The depth of suffering and the height of joy that these songs can articulate. One way that we can explain the mother of God is in song. My mother. So how did we get where we are today? A discernible shift in the place Fighting of Africa. what is most important in our lives. Light in my darkness. The Holy Spirit is able to. So if you want to participate in the movement, you've got to prepare yourself. Anchored in the Lord through the music of spiritual ancestors. O divine, O dear, O sweetest voice, for thou, O Christ, hast faithfully promised to be with us to the end of the world, and holding fast this promise as an anchor of hope, we faithful rejoice from the Paschal Matins. My heart has been so full anticipating this 30th annual con uh, conference of the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black. It is both a time for gratitude for what God has cultivated and a time to prayerfully ask his direction for the future, a time of reunion for old timers and a time to celebrate many new faces. It is a time to be anchored in the Lord. To be anchored in the Lord is to be anchored in the greatest of stories. But let's not pass over this question as if it were too obvious. What is a story? In a good story, your main character has a goal, encounters obstacles, and eventually overcomes them, emerging victorious. And the greatest of stories is the story of God's creative love for humans, our ingratitude and betrayal of his love and his work of reconciliation leading to our resurrection from sin and death. When we are anchored in the Lord, this story becomes the template of our lives. We relive it every year through the cycle of fasts and feasts. Our personal joys and sorrows gain meaning in conjunction with his. In Christ, we have no ordinary hero, but a special type, not one who conquers by his own wits or by the strength of his arm. No, in Christ, we have a paradoxical hero, one who wins by appearing to lose, one who wins by surrendering his life for the love of others. This is the greatest of stories. In the fellowship, we inhabit Christ's story in a particular way. You might say that we have a particular charism. We inhabit his story through honoring African saints and the spiritual ancestors who imitated his paradoxical heroism. You can probably name at least a handful of African saints, St. Moses, St. Mary of Egypt, Saints Perpetua and Felicity, St. Cyprian, and so on. But what do I mean by spiritual ancestors? These are not the ancestors of any, excuse me, these are the ancestors of any Christians who embrace them because spiritual ancestry is not a matter of DNA. It's a matter of spiritual kinship. These spiritual ancestors are none other than the enslaved Christians in America who worked in the cotton fields the rice fields, the tobacco, indigo, and sugar fields, who use their constrained and toilsome lives to become Christ-like, to become saints hidden in the Lord. And parenthetically, there were enslaved Christians in the time of the New Testament, and probably will be until the end of time. But regarding these spiritual ancestors, we know of their existence, thanks to three main sources. We know because of the recordings of slave narratives in the 1930s Federal Writers Project. 
we know because of accounts that have come down through their descendants. And finally, we know because of the repository of spirituals they left as their legacy to us. These spiritual ancestors were anchored in the Lord. They knew him deep in their bones. They lived the story of Jesus Christ through their particular life circumstances. They didn't live the Horatio Alger story. Boy overcomes the adversity of his humble beginnings and goes on to embody the American dream. No, they lived the paradoxical hero story of Jesus Christ. They lived daily with insurmountable adversity in the flesh and overcame in the spirit. And they overcame it in spiritual songs inspired by the breath of God. Last year, I spoke to you about baptizing culture, and if this is your first conference, you can find it on the Fellowship's YouTube channel. Baptizing culture means, like Abel in the book of Genesis, taking the very best from what God has given to us to cultivate and offering it back to the Lord. We don't want to be like Cain making a chintzy offering. We want to offer our very best, even our very best selves to the Lord. For the spiritual descendants of the enslaved Christians, that means offering the Negro spirituals back to the Lord in a way that fits the goals of the church. What is the goal of the church musically? Do you remember the old camp song, make new friends but keep the old, one is silver and the other is gold? Each generation of pastors crafts new sermons while we still honor the timeless homilies of St. John Chrysostom and the other great preachers. Each generation of painters crafts new icons while honoring the timeless ones preserved on Mount Athos and other historic places. Each generation of architects designs new temples while still honoring the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and the medieval churches in Orthodox Europe and Africa. So each generation of musicians needs to sing a new song to the Lord in addition to honoring the well-loved compositions of previous generations of composers. In the US, church musicians, especially those affiliated with the OCA seminaries, have been searching for the sounds of American Orthodox Christianity. That is, they are looking for inspiration for new liturgical settings uh, in distinctively American traditional folk music. One is sacred harp, which we often associate with Appalachia, although there have been black congregations that maintain that tradition. The other promising candidate is the African-American spiritual. When I began composing liturgical compositions inspired by spirituals in 2005, I was not aware of the bigger picture, or perhaps it was early in its development, but I composed in my own small bubble until 2021. That was when Molly Sanderson, daughter of our beloved pastor and founding member, Father Jerome, introduced me to her choir director, Dr. Jana Lehman. Jana led her Illinois Orthodox choir in performing my first three pieces in concert at St. Nicholas Antiochian uh, Orthodox Church in Urbana, Illinois in December of 2021. Jana is now a member of the fellowship, serves on our music committee, and will be conducting the choir for the morning liturgy. Last summer in 2022, she said she thought I was ready to begin composing a setting for the entire divine liturgy, since so many of the elements had already been set. Some people have asked me what my process was, and in particular, did I confer with other black Orthodox musicians? Here in general is my process. I began <clears throat> I began with a particular moment in the divine liturgy that I wished to compose for. What is happening in that moment? What are the clergy doing? What are the laity doing? What is the mood of the moment? Is it solemn? Is it joyful? What flavor of music will best support that moment? I search for a spiritual that fits that mood and whose original lyrics somehow complement what is happening liturgically. 
Then I begin composing. I want to strike the right balance for the ethnic flavor to come through, but I also do not want to make the original melody so dominant that it diverts people from the liturgical moment. In the Cherubic hymn, for example, the melody, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, is carried by the tenors, sandwiched by the female voices above and the bass voices below. In this way, the spiritual is transformed into something new without losing what it originally was. I like to think in terms of the consecration of the elements which become the body and blood of Jesus Christ without ceasing to have the appearance of bread and wine. The great litany and most other litanies are based on let us break bread together on our knees. It seemed appropriate as it is the original communion hymn of the, Afri of, of the African American Christians. It may not be widely known, but before the formation of the historical black denominations, there were many black Christians in the fully sacramental churches, the Roman Catholic and Anglican communions in states like Maryland and the Carolinas. Since then, the hymn has been widely embraced by Baptists, AME, and many others. In fact, the hymn has appeared in so many denominational hymnals, over a hundred, that it has a unifying charism. But not all the musical moments of the divine liturgy fit neatly into a song structure of repeated verses or verse and refrain. Many musical moments are very short, just one phrase, such as, and with thy spirit, or, and all men and women. And some moments are much longer, such as, in only begotten son. What did I do with those moments? The short phrases were treated like any other litany responses, and the longer ones required free composition. How did I approach free composition? There are several spiritual melodies represented in the Jubilee Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, but I selected two, one in a major key and one in a minor key to act as a musical framework for the rest of the compositions. What do I mean by a musical framework? I looked at the opening melody. What is the key? Where are the high and low points of the, mel of the melody? And then I composed something new preserving the key in those high and low points, but filling in more notes to get from uh, the trough to the peak and the peak to the trough. This would stretch it out. At other times, I thinned out the notes, preserving the most defining ones. This, of course, shortened the passage. After beginning in this manner, then I went into free composition as the liturgical words required. The major key melody that I incorporated in this manner is the one discussed earlier, let us break bread together. The minor key melody, perhaps not as well known, is you hear the lambs a crying. After I have a first draft of the music, I consult some of my orthodox black musician friends, almost always initially Molly, who is cradle orthodox and also grew up loving gospel music. And there are three others. And, when, and then, Jeanne Lehman spends considerable time prayerfully editing it. She tries to be sensitive to the spiritual genre while making the music easily singable by a four-part choir. And now, as we pray with this music in the morning, I will be consulting all of you. Does the music give your prayer wings? or does it hinder? Do you think the spiritual ancestors would be proud? I know the very existence of this work awakens hopes and fears, and so my work is, as it should be, under close observation from three main directions. Orthodox hierarchs, church musicians, and fellow African Americans. We are blessed this weekend, as you know, to have two bishops with us, His Grace Bishop Thomas of the Diocese of Oakland, Charleston, and the Mid-Atlantic, Antiochian Archdiocese is here with us, I believe for his second in-person conference, and His Grace Bishop Garasim of Fort Worth, OCA, our keynote, 
is also, I believe, attending his second in-person conference. Second? Yeah. I hope they will both be kind enough to share with us their impressions of the music after tomorrow's liturgy. His Eminence Metropolitan Sava, primate of the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese, gave his blessing for us to use the Jubilee Liturgy in the morning. His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophorus, primate of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, advised me that the only way to see if a liturgical setting works is to sing it in the Divine Liturgy. It's not enough to sing it in a concert setting. His Eminence sent his representative, Archimandrite Chrysostom, who will undoubtedly report back on his experience. Beyond that, this work is being observed by Orthodox Church musicians, both as they participate in singing or as they listen to recordings. But perhaps the real scrutiny is from my fellow black people who take pride in the spirituals as part of their own familial worship tradition a tradition that for generations has anchored them in the Lord. And believe me, if a composer is going to touch the sacred spirituals in this way, they want it done well or not at all. Father Moses said it mu as much at our last conference, and I have also heard this from others. I hear you, and of course I feel the same. The spirituals are very much a part of the spiritual anchor of my own family. Then there are other people who want to know if this work will somehow be imposed on their congregations. No, definitely not. Each choir director, in consultation with their pastor, selects the arrangements that are best for their choir and congregation. And oftentimes a choir director may select just certain elements from a liturgical setting, perhaps the litanies, the cherubic hymn, uh, the hymn to the Mother of God after the anaphora, communion hymns, trisagion, perhaps organically some of these elements will be incorporated in various parishes over time. So now that we have spoken to some of these hopes and fears, what should you expect at our liturgy in the morning? And how should you approach a divine liturgy which features a new musical setting? In a very real sense, even though this is a historic moment, you should treat it as any other liturgy during a retreat. Take time to read the prayers of preparation. Perhaps prepare for the sacrament of confession in the morning. Our goal is to step outside time and encounter Christ's eternity. One writer said that during the divine liturgy, we are transforming time into eternity. At the same time, with another part of your mind, you may notice how the music affects you as you strive to enter into the eternal heavenly liturgy. When is it a sweet chariot coming for to carry you home? When, when is it, hopefully not, but it could be, an obstacle so wide you can't get round it? Don't stress on this too much tomorrow because hopefully we will come out with a good recording that will allow for an analysis at a later date. Depending on the liturgical moment, the music of the Jubilee Liturgy may be earthy or ethereal. You may recognize the African-American spiritual inspiring it, or just sense that the music sounds very familiar in some way. But spirituals are far from my only influence. My primary musical training for the last 40 years has been standing and singing by ear at the Kleros or cantor stand. And at my monastery and the parish I regularly attend, the music has Russian roots. Some of the music in the Jubilee Liturgy, especially those variations in a minor key, might seem to have a Russian flavor. This was not intentional, but as composer Benedict Sheehan says in Jubilation, sometimes the unconscious influences are very powerful. Through the full journey of the Divine Liturgy, you will hear the sound of the spiritual ancestors and their descendants rendering something back to the Lord for all his benefits towards us. Dr. Jana as editor and, and conductor and myself as composer are lenses through which the music can coalesce and take shape. Now that I've introduced the music, let me say a little bit more about the mission of the fellowship 
and the orthodox musical world. As I noted earlier, I began composing in a small bubble, but slowly during my compositional journey, the connections began to develop. This was facilitated by a few things. First, Jana presented my cherubic hymn at the Sacred Music Institute held at Antiochian Village in the summer of 2022. Second, a very big factor was the release of Jubilation, Cultures of Sacred Music at our last conference in Pittsburgh. And also, some notable church musicians attended our last conference and I was able to converse with them. And third, this past June, I served as a featured composer and guest faculty at the Summer Music Institute at St. Vladimir's Seminary in Crestwood, New York. There, I was able to interact with a number of Orthodox Church musicians and conductors. I presented four pieces from the Jubilee Liturgy, and they were sung for the first time in the services with His Grace Bishop Gerasim serving, by the way. Um, Uh, these offerings were well received and helped us form musical friendships. And now we have friends who are considering including some of our music in their upcoming concert seasons. The first of these concerts is planned for the OCA Archdiocesan Choir under the direction of Juliana Whittle in January in Washington, D.C. They might use one or two pieces. Um, Following that will be a concert by Capella Romana under the direction of Alexander Lingus in February in Portland and Seattle. In this concert, the opening half will feature my compositions of the spirituals that are, and, and the spirituals that inspired them. The second half will feature How Sweet the Sound, the Orthodox Vespers done in the style of gospel music. This is the creation of Dr. Sean Thunder Wallace, who debuted the work in February of 2020. Our own Father Moses was a speaker on that occasion. How does this further the mission of, the, of our fellowship? Father Moses likes to tell a story of his first visit to an Orthodox mission where he found icons of St. Moses and St. Cyprian of Carthage on the iconostasis. He realized that he was finally seeing all the flowers in God's garden some of which looked like him, blooming in the Orthodox Church. He realized that there was a place for him there, despite how unfamiliar, even jarring, some of the elements initially seemed. It allowed for him to stay, open his heart, and let the otherworldly prayers touch him deeply. My hope is that whether in concert or in liturgy, Americans, and especially black Americans, will hear this music and realize that there is plenty good room for them, not only in the Father's kingdom, but also in the Orthodox Church. Of course, when I tell people that, they sometimes tell me that these four-part settings may be mu musically satisfying, but they are much too complex for the missions and small parishes that could benefit most from using them. My reasons for beginning with four-part are very pragmatic. A local performance by a four-part choir was the door Providence opened for me through Jana's willingness to showcase something new. My hope is that after this conference, to do three things. First, to reflect on the feedback we get, we get regarding tomorrow's Jubilee Liturgy, and to make appropriate revisions. Second, to begin working on ver versions of the liturgy setting for one to three voices. And third, to keep on composing with God's help. In closing, I hope that singers of all ethnic backgrounds will sing this music together and form a soul bond. My hope is that people will recognize the spiritual depth of the ancestors who composed the original songs that inspired the Jubilee Liturgy and be uplifted by their musical witness and legacy. I have many hopes, some that I can articulate and some that are beyond the reach of my words. But my deepest hope is that through this music, we can all be more fully anchored in the Lord. Thank you.